Hi, everyone. I think it's uh, time to get started. It's 525. So welcome, everyone, to uh, this session, building a multi-cluster environment service mesh at Airbnb. And we have the presenters uh, Weibo He and Stephen Chan. My name is Henrik Blixt, and I'm the moderator. So just a few couple of notes before we get started. So we'll do questions at the end. I'm going to be running around with the microphone. So once we get to the Q&A, raise your hand. I'll run over as quickly as I can with the microphone. Um, if there are questions we don't have time to cover, uh, please do that out in the hallway with the presenters uh, so we can clear the room. And also, lastly, don't forget to rate the session uh, in the Sked app when we're done. So just quick intros, and then we'll, we'll get, get going. So Stephen uh, is uh, passionate about large-scale distributed systems, open source, technical leadership, and engineering excellence. And he's currently focused on solving scaling challenges of infrastructure uh, high growth companies like Airbnb. Uh, Weibo uh, works on building performance scalable and resilient distributed systems in the cloud. And he's currently focused on building the next generation service mesh at Airbnb. And with that, with that I'll leave the floor to the presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everyone. My name is Weibo and this is Stefan. We are both engineers from the Cloud Foundation team at Airbnb. Today, we are very excited to walk you through our experience of building a multi-cluster, multi-environment service mesh on top of Istio on Airbnb. Here's the agenda for today. We will start by um, introducing where we are at in our service mesh journey. Then we're going to talk about why we need a multi-cluster service mesh and how we deploy Istio to enable that. After that, we will cover multi-environment support, including multiple tier, mesh expansion, and external services. And finally, we're going to end with key takeaways. In the past few years, Airbnb, like many of our peer companies, have transitioned from the monolith architecture to SOA. At the same time, we also migrated the, mo the majority of our workloads from, Kubernetes, uh, from EC2 to Kubernetes. As we underwent such fundamental infra changes, our legacy in-house service mesh no longer meets our needs. In 2019, we started a search of modern service mesh and landed on Istio as the foundation. For more information about this choice, feel free to check out our uh, Istio.com talk earlier this year linked on the slide. Last year, we evaluated different uh, deployment models and uh, deployed Istio in production. We started migrating a small percentage of Airbnb workloads onto Istio. And by end of last year, we have about a few dozen services connected to Istio and a few percentage of traffic going through Istio proxy. This year, after successfully um, adoption on different kinds of workloads and operating is Istio in production for a few quarters, um, we establish enough confidence in both Istio itself and our operational expertise in Istio. We started our full speed migration to Istio. Currently, we have connected almost all of our thousand microservices to Istio and migrated about a third of production traffic onto Istio. Our plan is to fully migrate and sunset our legacy service mesh next year. As we productionize uh, our next generation service mesh, we encountered a few requirements. The first requirement is multi-cluster. As Airbnb doubled down on Kubernetes adoption, our Kubernetes usage exploded. We started running to scalability issues in SCD and API servers. So instead of vertically scaling a single Kubernetes clusters, we made the decision to horizontally scale out by distributing workloads across multiple clusters. In practice, we keep each Kubernetes cluster under uh, 1,000 nodes and add more clusters when we need capacity. For more info about the multi-cluster design, please check out our 2019 Kubeton talk linked below. Translating this into concrete requirements for our next-gen service mesh, we needed to scale for tens of Kubernetes clusters with hundreds of microservices tens of hundreds, thousands of nodes, and hundreds of thousands of pods. How do we partition our workloads across clusters? At Airbnb, we treat clusters as a pool of compute and um, memory resources. Workloads are randomly assigned to uh, clusters at 
workload creation time. Um, as a result, services makes cross-cluster network requests all the time. In this example call chain, three uh, cross-cluster network calls were made. This simple example pretty much illustrated what's happening in production. It often takes more than 10 hops, most of which um, are cross-cluster to serve a user request. This cross-cluster communication pattern heavily influences our next decision. As services communicate cross-clusters all the time, the added latency of cost of going through a gateway for every hop is too expensive for us. That's why we adopted a flat network model across clusters. We leverage AWS VPC CNI to assign individually addressable VPC IPs to pods, so pods can make direct connection across clusters. Using VPC um, CNI for cross-cluster communication has a few benefits over our in-house service mesh, with ut which utilizes uh, Kubernetes no-port services. VPC CNI has a lower overhead than no-ports, which use lots of complex IP table rules, which doesn't scale particularly well for large clusters. VPC CNI also does not um, lead to a well-known pod co-location problem, which is when multiple pods of the same service are scheduled onto the same node, they appear as one address and gets deduped by Envoy. So uh, each pod on the, this node will get less traffic. And finally, by providing pods with VPC IPs, we can leverage the rich functionalities cloud providers built. Examples include assigning pods custom security groups. Flat network does come with its requirements. First, um, your organization should not solely rely on network boundary as the only security measure. At Airbnb, our flat network is segregated into different security zones with security groups. Within the flat network, we follow a zero trust network model and um, where all workloads are protected by MTLS. Secondly, a flat network requires all your workloads to be using non-overlapping IPs. Luckily for us, this has always been the case. We, the infra team, centrally manage our private CIDR ranges and allocated two slash 10 CIDR blocks for mesh workloads, which can fit 8 million IPv4 IPs and give us enough headroom before we move to IPv6. Finally, AWS has a VPC limit on the maximum number of IPs you can fit into a flat network. Since VPC CNI assigns unique pods, uh, one, node with, one node with 16 pods consumes 17 IP mappings, which hugely increase the number of IP mappings in our VPC and push us over the limit. After close collaboration with AWS, we now leverage a new uh, VPC feature called prefix delegation. Instead of tracking pod IPs on the node separately, the VPC now assigns a single slash 28 prefix, which fits 16 IPs, by the way, to a node and allocate pod IPs from that prefix range, which greatly reduce our mapping usage. Taking into full consideration of all our multi-cluster requirements, we adopted an external control plane and flat network model for Istio deployment, which has the following benefits. First, um, it leads to a clean separation of roles. We, the service mesh team, serve as both the mesh operator and admin. We manage the upgrade and release of Istio, and we provide the service mesh platform. Service owners, on the other hand, are in charge of their managing their own um, services with tasks like defining allow lists, which services allow to talk to my service, and allocating sufficient resource for their Istio proxy. Secondly, external control plane provides better security. We only need to install the CA certs uh, issued by Airbnb's internal CA system on the control plane cluster. We can enforce a tight access control for the control plane cluster. Thirdly, um, external control plane model provides better isolation from data plane workloads. We want to make sure that no data plane workloads can affect the uh, health of the control plane. Finally, we perform Istio upgrades quarterly. It's much easier to operate one control plane per mesh than n deployments across clusters. A single external control plane 
thus impose a strict requirement on the availability and reliability of the control plane. We will cover in the next section the steps we take to meet that requirement. Here's our high-level architectural diagram within a single mesh. Uh, we deploy Istio in a dedicated external Kubernetes cluster. It is the blue box in this graph. Only control plane components run from this cluster, and only the service mesh team has permission to this cluster. All Istio custom resources reside in this external cl cluster, um, but mesh, cluster, uh, mesh users do not directly modify their resources. We provide a simple configuration file that mesh users interact with. They check in this configuration file alongside their service code. And during CI, we generate Istio custom resources from that configuration file. The generated Istio resources are managed by our deployment system. And all config changes are made by a deploy, which is monitored and can be easily rolled back. The remote workload cluster, uh, the the pink boxes in this graph only need to define a sidecar injection uh, webhook, which delegates the injection of the Istio proxy to the control plane cluster. Other than the webhook, workload clusters only need to define um, Istio reader role, which give Istio D permission to watch for Kubernetes updates. How do remote clusters dis discover the control plane? We run a deployment of external DNS which uh, on the con uh, management cluster, sorry, um, and configure external DNS to export uh, ECOD as a headless service re registered to, uh, in Route 53 to be used as the discovery address for the workload clusters. In addition to multi-cluster requirements, we also have multi-environment requirements for the mesh. The first kind of environments I will cover is multi-tier. We rely on a multi-tier mesh to minimize downtime of the control plane. Airbnb services are generally divided into three tiers, test, staging, and production. When building our next generation service mesh, we follow a similar concept of tiers to minimize the blast radius of changes. Our first tier of mesh deployment is the sandbox tier. In this tier, we run functional and performance tests to validate the new release of Istio and Istio proxy. After the new release is verified on the sandbox tier, we deploy it to the test tier. Test mesh has an identical setup as the production mesh, but runs in a separate AWS account for maximum isolation. And finally, we deploy the new Istio release to the production mesh. Both staging and production tier of services connect to production mesh. In Sandbox Mesh, we run automated functional tests to verify mesh features that we depend on in production, like authorization policy or uh, locality-based load balancing. Additionally, we define regression tests for issues we found in the past. For instance, uh, we encountered a bug where Istio would get stuck if a large deployment was rapidly scaled down. We automated the repro of such regressions and uh, make sure that the issue continue to be fixed for future releases. We also run data plane performance tests with our specific configuration of Istio proxy uh, using Nighthawk. In test mesh, we test every single integration point with Airbnb systems and run end-to-end -end integration tests. For instance, we test that Istio can, secu uh, can securely mount the CA certs from our internal CA system. We test new Kubernetes version release won't break the service mesh. Um, we test changes to the resource generation logic. And finally, we can test all the custom logic we built for mesh expansion and external services. We have successfully ca ca caught regressions in both Istio itself and in related Airbnb systems in test mesh. After verifying the safety of the new release on the standalone mesh and test mesh, we deployed the new Istio to a production mesh with a revision label. The initial deploy was safe as there will be no workloads connected to the new version. We gradually increase the scope of services connected to the new version as we build confidence. Note that services only connect to the new version um, after a deploy. 
at any time, if there's any regression, service owners can simply roll back the deployment to pick up the old version. The entire rollout process takes about a month. After there's no more proxies connected to the old version of the control plane, we will clean up the old version. Um, this rollout process allows us to slowly increase the number of proxies connected to old version. As a matter of fact, we have just finished the rollout of Istio 1.10 and teardown of 1.9 one month ago. Uh, this graph shows you a gradual increase of proxies connected to 1.10 versus 1.9. We can also side-by-side side compare the new version against the old version. This graph shows you the impact of how uh, a new feature called Discovery Selector introduced in 1.10 reduced the CPU usage of Istio when we excluded some of our most noisy um, namespaces. Now I'm going to hand over to Stefan and to talk about the rest of multi-environments. Thanks, Weibo. So we've covered how our service mesh spans uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters and multiple environments. So now we're going to deep dive into two non-Kubernetes use cases. First, we're going to talk about how we support workloads running on uncontainerized EC2, which internally we call mesh expansion, as well as external services uh, like managed data stores. So here's some context about uh, why we wanted to support uh, EC2 on Istio. So in the long term, we want to run all of our internal services on Kubernetes. However, in the shorter to medium term, we want all the benefits of a single uniform service mesh running across all workloads. And the workloads that are not already running on Kubernetes will take years to either migrate or deprecate. These are uh, either legacy or very stateful workloads. So the solution that we uh, came up with was to support EC2 on our service mesh. The requirements are first, we want to have full feature parity with Kubernetes. So service owners can reuse their uh, knowledge of how to work with service mesh on both EC2 and Kubernetes. And secondly, we want to allow gradual traffic shifting onto Kubernetes when services are ready to migrate. So let's go back and revisit Weibo's slide on Kubernetes architecture. This diagram adds a high level overview of how EC2 workloads fit in. So the orange box on the bottom right shows EC2 workloads as part of the mesh. Now that we've covered the high-level architecture, we'll dive into the mechanics of how we got to feature parity for EC2. First, we'll talk a little bit about how endpoint registration evolved. In Kubernetes, the endpoints controller automatically handles this by updating endpoints resources based on pod readiness. The resources then get watched by Istio-D and distributed to clients. When we first decided to adopt Istio, we had to manually tell the Istio control plane which EC2 IPs belong to which services by hand editing configs. Due to the number of EC2 services in the instance change update rate, this added unacceptable additional operational load. And over the past year, we've worked with the Istio community to define our requirements. The solution the community built is a feature called auto registration. So the Istio, D, uh, data, uh, the Istio data plane has two processes which run on all service instances, whether they're EC2 or Kubernetes. Uh, these are Pilot Agent and Envoy. When Envoy starts up, it will connect via XDS to Pilot Agent, which proxies the connection. Pilot Agent will then connect to the Istio D control plane and provides metadata about which service it belongs to using that XDS connection. Istio D will create a Kubernetes CRD called workload entry on behalf of the connecting Pilot Agent process. And then the workload entry is what registers the service instance in the mesh. Other SDOD pods will read workload entry and distribute that service instance to other clients. Server-side health checks were also implemented by SDO community in the past year. The health check process begins in the same way as auto registration. First, pilot agent proxies XDS for Envoy. Pilot agent then does health checks, which is similar to how Kubelet does health checks in Kubernetes. Pilot agent will then send health information across the same single XDS connection to an IstioD control plane pod. And IstioD will alter the healthy status of the auto-registered workload entry. Other IstioD pods will read and react accordingly, adding the endpoint if the workload entry transitioned to healthy and removing it if it transitioned to unhealthy. Okay, the TLS story is a little bit more complex. 
So the Istio community plans some automation around getting certificates, but the timeline is unknown, so we built our own automation. There are two tasks needed to bootstrap TLS. First, we need to get the root CA, and second, we need to provide proof to the CA to get a workload certificate with a spiffy SAN. Uh, STOD starts by writing the root CA as a config map in the Kubernetes API. Uh, we built an in-house tool called MX Agent, which creates a service account token and reads the CA config map that STOD wrote by calling the K, uh, Kubernetes API. MX Agent then writes the CI cert and token to the local file system on the VM instance. When Pilot Agent starts up, it will read the CA and token from the file system and then issue a CSR to STOD. Finally, Envoy will get its certificates from Pilot Agent using SDS. Uh, Istio version upgrades are also slightly complex. So let's backtrack and quickly review how Istio versions are chosen in Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, we use an internal tool called CRISPR, which runs as an admission controller. It reads a configuration file called rollouts.yaml, which maps Kubernetes namespaces to mutator artifact versions. And we wrote a blog post about CRISPR, which is linked in the uh, bottom of the slide. CRISPR downloads the mutator artifact from storage and then patches the pod label with an Istio version label. Istio D then gets called as another mutating admission controller, which does the main sidecar injection. And the Istio D version called is determined by the Istio revision label. CRISPR is designed with the Kubernetes use case in mind, so we couldn't reuse this for EC2. However, we took key lessons from CRISPR and created a very similar interface. For EC2, we built a parallel system. First, there is a CLI named MX Rollout, which reads a rollouts file similar to CRISPR's rollouts configuration format. MX Rollout will then update an EC2 tag named desired version on a particular instance. When MX Agent starts up, it will read the desired version tag value. And this tag value uh, maps to an artifact which contains pilot agent and envoy binaries, as well as other configuration. MX Agent will download this artifact, unpack it, and restart the pilot agent service running on the host. Finally, MX Agent updates the value of the running version tag on the instance. Here's a high level overview of CRISPR and our MX updating system side by side. There's uh, several similarities that you can see between them. Okay, let's switch tracks and talk about how we supported external services. Most of our external services used custom protocols like uh, MySQL and Redis. So when scoping solutions, we grouped external services and non-HTTP services together. External services can't run Istio data plane components. So we have a slightly different set of requirements compared to supporting EC2. First, non-HTTP support was important. We wanted to allow service owners to define custom Redis pings or MySQL health checks. Secondly, we wanted to uh, use DNS to map external service URLs to a unique Kubernetes cluster IP. External services are registered in Istio using service entry, but without an IP field, service entry results in an envoy listener that takes up all IPs on a given port. We're moving off of a service discovery system that relies on port allocation, and we want to avoid this kind of setup wherever possible. And finally, we want to remove stale endpoints, for example, when database replicas are torn down. So here's how we solved server-side health checks. We built a generic health check sidecar called MHCX. Airbnb internal owners will build protocol-specific health checks into an application container and then run MHCX as a sidecar. MHCX is responsible for translating health check results into workload entry updates, effectively doing the same thing that IstioD was doing with um, VM health checking. And then the app health checker main container is responsible for uh, querying external endpoints using the custom protocols and providing an HTTP response to MHCX. For our DNS cluster IP setup and endpoint removal, um, we have two parts. So first, for the DNS cluster IP setup, under the hood, 
we create both a Kubernetes service and a service entry CRD. Uh, we uh, ensure that the service is uh, created first before the service entry, and then when a new service is created, um, when the new service entry is created, we add a mutating admission controller, which patches the service entry uh, IP with the cluster IP of the generated service. And for stale endpoint removal, we rely on Spinnaker to run a cleanup command, which is similar to kubectl prune. Now that we've covered um, several environments in which we run Istio, let's cover the key concepts which we use to successfully run it. First, we ran a globally flat network but be aware that there are considerations around utilization and scalability of this approach. Secondly, we use a single external management cluster for each service mesh. And this is important for secure and simple management of each mesh. Third, we use multiple tiers of pre-production meshes, which allow for different types of testing and ensure we catch as many issues as possible before production. Fourth, Istio support for VMs has matured considerably in the past year. We built additional tooling to reach full feature parity and allow a long-term migration path to Kubernetes. And finally, we have generic mechanisms for supporting non-HTTP and external services, which ensures the service mesh team does not have to implement n different Envoy filters for n different protocols. All right. Finally, Airbnb is hiring, so please check out our website for open positions. And now I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thanks, looks like we have about eight minutes left for questions. So raise your hand, I'll try and run around with the microphone, I'm starting up front here. Uh, hi, that was a great presentation. You had a lot of things packed in there. One question uh, when it comes to a lot of uh, services in the cluster that Istio has to uh, look upon. So uh, I know um, Istio gets a lot of charity, uh, chattiness. How did you uh, manage that? Um, yeah. So Istio has a sidecar CRD that filters out uh, the listeners, the clusters uh, that you get. Uh, as part of our simple configuration file that we uh, we ask service owners to provide, we uh, f like force everyone to define the exact set of uh, other services that they care about. So that way it's greatly reduced the number of um, like unnecessary updates to each service. So it's a more controlled environment where uh, service owners uh, have to know what they want to be talking to the Yes. Okay. Because for us that's a bigger blocker and you know, uh, in lower environments, Totally understood. We tested uh, Istio without uh, using like the, that sidecar CRD and the performance. It's hard to scale for like tens of thousands of pods and thousands of services. I got. I was more curious, because um, our environment looks a lot like your guys'. Um, have you tried the multi-cluster mode in Istio and not use the service entry? Uh, can, can you provide a little more information about like how the service in, um, how multi-cluster would um, Yeah, so the, the newer versions of Istio, you can define different, you can call your um, different Istio setups different names. Um, and then basically it talks to the Kubernetes API um, that is trying to access, and then the, the service uh, endpoints are advertised everywhere. So you don't have to create service entries. Um, they're, all clusters know about all the endpoints. Oh, I see. So uh, we are uh, allowing Istio to read from multiple clusters. Uh, for service entry, we use that exclusively for external services, so like services that we aren't running in-house. So yeah, uh, if we go back to the architecture diagram, um, we are running uh, multi-cluster mode. So the centralized ECOD subscribe to uh, different workload uh, Kubernetes clusters. And for Kubernetes workloads, they use directly use Kubernetes services and Kubernetes endpoints. Uh, 
and uh, we don't define the service entry. It's only for non-Kubernetes, like VM workloads oh, and external services, we define service entry because there's no pods. Okay. And can I ask one more question? Yes. Just curious. Because um, we, again, we run into this problem. Do, do you guys use the Helm chart or use the, the profile? It's your profile file, the CRD. Uh, we use the operator to uh, generate uh, the, the basically raw manifest and check them in, into the source code. So we know what, like, uh, we, we feel uncomfortable uh, asking it operator to handle all the upgrades. We would like to know what exactly is going on with each ECO release. So you use to generate Manifest, Correct. yes. Yes. It, where does the operator that uh, injects the sidecar live? Is it, is it in the control plane cluster, or is it running in each individual cluster? So the question is, where does the uh, sidecar injector live? Uh, yeah. The webhook live on every workload cluster, but the uh, mutator service, the ECOD, only runs from the management cluster, the, the external cluster. So there will be a per workload cluster webhook that basically points uh, to the central uh, ECOD address. Since you bring up so many clusters dynamically, do you ever hit any weird race conditions where the, the webhook is maybe not up before the, the application pod and then your sidecar isn't alive or something like that? So, um, yeah, uh, we run a, like verification workloads on, on each cluster before we mark it as schedulable basically before we can assign workloads to that cluster. Um, and uh, our rate of cluster creation is like more on that like order of hours rather than like minutes or something. So we usually go through a, a verification process. Does your TD system not deploy any codes or applications until the cluster is marked as top Yes. Correct, yeah. Uh, one, of, one of the most painful things uh, we face when we upgrade a steel uh, version, right, is the Envoy filters. Because the APIs break really easily. It, it, it is super painful. How do you manage that in Airbnb? I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, Envoy, we, we try to um, keep our Envoy filters fairly portable. Like, we've written two that one that customizes uh, logging slightly and one that customizes metrics to use like a uh, native envoy filter but um, definitely agree that um, there are some pain points with with upgrading like because the like internals of like envoy configuration are, are unstable so we just try to keep it as, as simple as possible there yeah we definitely felt a pain point uh, hi, yeah, I had a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, you noticed that you had a bug where Istio was getting stuck on rapid scale down of deployments. I was wondering if you could provide a little more details and like where was Istio getting stuck and um, how you fixed that issue. Yeah, um, that particular issue, uh, like I can send you the get uh, the issue offline. I. It's, it happens a while ago. Um, I think um, what we observe is when a large deployment rapidly scale down and ECLD will um, basically uh, fail to send out any subsequent updates. Um, like the, more details can be found in the, the GitHub issue. Um, I, I don't remember any more details right now, sorry. But the, uh, the issue that we ran into was, I think, in 1.5 or 1.6, mm -hmm. so uh, several um, minor releases ago, and we haven't observed it since. So when you have two over here, when you have two clusters, um, can uh, uh, when services in one cluster, can they be, talk to services in the other cluster without like changing anything about the service definition itself? Is that like so? the services themselves like, wouldn't know which cluster pods, pods they're talking to? Or do you have to like specify which cluster you want to talk to when you... Uh, so when services, uh, services when, when they're making cross-cluster network calls, they are unaware of the destination cluster. So um, 
we define a mesh ID, like a, uh, depending on the region, EA1 US, and that's shared uh, across clusters. So from the perspective uh, of a service, it doesn't know where the destination service runs from. As a matter of fact, that service can run from multiple different clusters. And SDLD is going to combine the endpoints, uh, like fetch the endpoints and combine the endpoints, uh, group the endpoints on the same namespace. And uh, so requests can be load balanced across clusters. So I think we're, we're at time. So, so thanks, thanks sir. we can uh, continue uh, questions outside in the hallway so you can clear the room so they can close down. So thanks everyone for coming, appreciate it. Don't forget to rate the session afterwards in the, in the app.